Hey everybody, welcome to Obscurities and Miniatures, and it's Friday, which means we're going to bring to you another Obscurity in Literature, and I'm not going to actually talk about Silver Surfer Black, because I already did that before, uh, but I wanted to point something out. I really dig when Marvel, or basically really any company, kind of does something against the grain, doesn't do everything same old, same old. I've really liked this about the early volumes of like Kill Six Billion Demons, for example, where almost literally every volume has been a different size and shape. But I really like when Marvel does these big treasury editions. They're pretty few and far between in the last few years. And honestly, it's really to the benefit, I think, of the artist. Uh, not to say that the writing is necessarily bad, but I think it really you know, gives the art a moment to shine when you have some of these artists that really just go balls to the wall bonkers crazy with what they're drawing like Trad Moore does. Um, I've got a couple other ones, but the one I wanted to really talk about today is one of the most recent ones, especially since we just had Comic-Con come and go. As you can see, uh, I don't think I've ever talked about this one yet. Maybe we'll save this for another one. Uh, Tom Scioli's grand design for Fantastic Four in all its ultra retro curviness that's a, a story for another time that's not actually what i wanted to talk about either uh i wanted to talk about the most recent treasury edition and that is peach momoko's demon days so right off the bat uh, i know peach momoko has gotten a lot of attention for her really intricate elaborate well done cover art and rightfully so i mean she's a, a talented artist to say the least and i mean just the composition the layout especially in her covers usually is just really rocking um really enjoyed a lot of the stuff that she's done and these are big books and the funny thing is none of them are actually the same size or shape which is kind of kind of bizarre and just to give you a good idea here's a regular size comic book which i'm going to assume that this actually was originally uh, if you guys ever want to hear stories about this stuff, oh, we'll save we'll save uh, the 1963 books for some other day. So yeah, originally I want to say this was a bunch of short one-shot books. We have this Yoshida story, which is kind of its main topic, but then there's a couple other stories kind of sprinkled throughout. And to me, that's what works. Is this groundbreaking literature? No, but I don't think it ever set out to be. I think it was a, a nice uh, bare bones, I don't want to say bare bones, but a nice basic plot to really put together a cool excuse to draw neat stuff. Is there a story? Yes. Uh, are there parts of it that, to me, were a little difficult to understand? Yeah, to be honest, and I don't know if that's just something that was lost in translation. It's hard to say. So we opened the book up with a traditional yokai story where we have you know the demons of japan and the oni and all that fun stuff and obviously there's characters that look somewhat familiar mostly x-men stuff and it's funny how in some sections we will have english you know sound effects but in later sections they're going to go to japanese to me, I thought that this first volume was probably the strongest, or the first story, just in terms of layout, composition, and use of panels. And again, for artists like this, these big, giant treasury editions, I think, are fantastic. It's fun trying to figure out which character is which as well. There is no denying this is some gorgeous artwork. Interesting thing is it reads a lot like regular manga as opposed to a more you know, traditional American comic. As somebody who's read lots and lots of manga, uh, it tends to be something I tend to speed through. So we have that and then we transition to a modern day story. Again, just really nice artwork. There were bits that I was like, eh, a bit tropey, I thought, for this modern section. But it works. I'm still not 100% sure who the main villain was supposed to be. Let's say we've got a mystique there. In fact, there's a couple of characters I'm not sure. Some are a bit more obvious than others.
So we finish in the middle of the book with the end of the Ashida saga, and then we go to another... Oh no, this isn't it. There, was, there is another little vignette story. Starring Electra. And then after that, we got a nice section. I was going to show you guys. Like I was saying earlier, I found it funny how early on we have the English sound effects. And then later on they're in Japanese. Then in the very same section, I guess they go back to English. Again, as somebody who reads a lot of manga, you know, you're, you're kind of used to it. She has a spider on her shirt. I wonder why. So we're going to jump to the back here on the yokai files. And they talk about all of the various types quite quickly. Oh, what it? We got Raijin and Fujin. Go Sutendoji. Sutendoji, there was a cool Gonagai manga that I really dig. I always say that. <laughs> when I was I think in high school, I think I first discovered it. Maybe it was in college. I can't recall now. But long since traded it off or got rid of it. But, um, Years back, we actually went to one of the places where he was supposed to have been enshrined or something, which was kind of cool. I've got a picture of my kids in front of. I enjoyed it. They were like, let's go home. Of course, the Gonagai version ends with spaceships and magic, like most Gonagai manga do, with copious amounts of nudity and violence, but that's not to be surprising anyway. Bunch of the alternate covers in the back here with some pretty big names. Very familiar names. We got Stan Sakai, actually, which is kind of cool. David Mack, J. Scott Campbell, Bengal. I recognize his stuff. French dude. Good old Trad Moore, Ron Lim. I gotta say, he's really refined his style over the years. Michael Alred. Get that in focus, maybe. I think I've still got some of the original Tundra Black and White Mad Men adventures that he did. That's got to be like 92, 93 with like illustrations on the interior covers that he put in there. Those were a long time ago. Scotty Young. Can't go wrong with an extra Sinkovich cover. So yeah, just overall, nicely put together book. And I forgot in the back we've got a designer notes as well on how all the characters are designed we'll save that for you so there's something to look forward to but like i said the story i mean it's pretty predictable i wasn't expecting any groundbreaking works like i said earlier but for what it is and what it does as a i don't know almost like a fluff piece but like a passion project thing of just giving the artist a chance to really let their chops loose i can't think of any other books that have really had interiors by Momoko, which is funny saying because that's a nickname for one of my daughter's friends. I just called her Momo-chan. Anyway, um, yeah, overall i got to say, really nice book, really heavy book, really thick book. So if you like big, heavy, thick books with very intricate, nicely done artwork that you can come back to and pour over like the other ones, I think this is a, a good addition to the library. And, you know, I'm going to keep voting with my wallet as long as Marvel wants to put out interesting stuff like this, especially in interesting formats. I'm game. I mean, I may not follow a lot of their stuff these days, but, you know, I absolutely grew up with it and still have a really soft spot for a lot of their comics and their artists. So, kudos to Marvel, kudos to Peach Momoko, and thank you for letting me have this on my shelf. Well, I should be thanking myself because I got it my money. Anyway, with that said, this has been High Lord Tamburlaine with Obscurities and Miniatures saying thanks for watching, and we will see you back here soon. Bye-bye.